Hello, everybody, and welcome to What the Hell Should I Watch? I'm Steve Stebbing. I'm Chloe Stebbing. And we're here to put, uh, we're here to get, <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're here to tell you what to watch, or not forcefully, but give you suggestions of what to watch <laughs> this weekend and over the following week. Uh, we come out every Friday at 9 a.m. right here on the Steve Stebbing YouTube channel. And uh, I wish I had a better movie to start with. I it this this one I mean I I think I jinxed it or called it uh last week when I said I wasn't super excited for this movie but it's Blumhouse's Imaginary. A woman returns to her childhood home to discover that the imaginary friend she left behind is very real and unhappy that she abandoned him. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first red flag of this movie is that it was directed by Jeff Wadlow. And I mean, the track record for Jeff Wadlow is not fantastic. Uh, he did that weird yo play yop looking movie, Truth or Dare, with the weird smiles. Oh. And yeah, you know that movie? Yeah. He remade the 70s and 80s show Fantasy Island as a horror movie. Yeah a couple of years ago and that was not very good and not scary at all uh he did a movie in the mid 2000s called cry wolf that was also not good at all <laughs> and he did the sequel to kick ass which really 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 severely bummed me out that movie bummed me the hell out because you have such a good template it. yeah jim carrey was in it like it was supposed to be like the bigger and better addition on to kick ass like because Kick-Ass 2, the comic book, is a really cool comic book. And he just failed it. Just failed it. And so, for that reason, wasn't too excited about this one. Um, it's really weird. And I don't know if we touched on this last week. I think we did a, a, um, a little bit. But it's really weird that Imaginary Friend is the theme of 2024. At least yeah. in movies in the first half of the year. Yeah. Like, I don't... this is like when they made um, Snow White movies at the same time. Right. Or like a trend, like a fad. Or like the 2010 zombie era where everything was zombies. Which was the 10 year mark after the 2000 era zombie movie push. It's every, every 10 years? Every 10 years? Yeah. Well, I yeah, don't know. I think... Now... Now, now it's back with um, the Walking Dead's "The Ones Who Live," which is getting a phenomenal ratings, and yeah. it's very, very good. You should watch it. That's good. That's good. Is it the better of the spinoffs? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I struggled good. through Fear Dead City, Fear the Walking oh, Dead, Fear the Walking Dead, which is struggled is it done now or is it done. still going? I think it's done now. Um, okay. They're pumping out ads Fun. for it like crazy, but I don't think there's anything mm. new. I keep checking, well, and it's still just season eight. Well, they um, Lionsgate actually just sent me the Blu-ray for eight. I got it last right. week. Okay. Um, but then there's Dead City, mm -hmm. right? Which is the Negan and Maggie show. Yeah, which was underwhelming. And then, okay, and then there was Dale Dixon. Which was also underwhelming. Was underwhelming? Okay. Well, because the whole point of the, the, the Daryl Dixon one was like, oh, we're going to see variants because it's Paris and that's where the variants are and that's where the virus supposedly originated. But there were no right. variants. There was not even like a hint. Um, and then Dead City was just Maggie and Negan arguing the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. What were you? Who are we talking about? Oh, yeah, we're talking about <laughs> imaginary. 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 Um, I, I like uh, the lead actress in it, DeWanda Wise. I I because I, I liked her in the uh, the James Samuel Netflix movie, uh, The Harder They The Harder They Come. 
uh, was like a Western with Jonathan Majors and uh, Idris Elba and just a huge cast. Um, I liked her in that. She is just she can't hold this movie together at all. Nobody can hold this movie together at all. Uh, Betty Buckley is in this one and um, might remember her from uh, Split. She was the psychiatrist in Split. Okay. Um, she is in her own movie when they get to the third act that I was like, where did this come from? Which is followed by an exit that didn't make any sense. And there's so much about this. Like the, the movie starts out with a very interesting and, and kind of cool looking scene that's really fun and nightmarish. But that's like the pinnacle of the movie is the first <laughs> three and a half minutes and it's just it's all downhill from there it's not a scary movie at all um and yeah i i I think it's just a waste of time in theaters really and which is really funny because i was one of six people in the theater and the other five were these loud like teenage girls that decided to come in and be on their phones the entire time and kick the hell out of the seats to the point that I actually had to yell at them and drop some serious F-bombs on them. I I was yelling before I even, I know I was, I was yelling before I even knew I was yelling. Like it was, it was one of those out of body moments because I just felt like I'm already watching a terrible movie. (laughs) Like, yeah, don't make this any worse on me and and theater etiquette I hate to be yeah. this guy it it's a really it's really important to me no <laughs> really yeah no is. it's it's really important to me too like there is a Good. specific way that you are supposed to behave in a theater like respect the space that you're in and mm-hmm. it it makes me so mad when like people just don't respect theaters mm-hmm. and I've I've yelled at some people in my time. <laughs> Even as a child, you remember this? <laughs> mm-hmm, I do. Yeah. I do. There was a Twilight screening where you yelled at somebody. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Pretty, pretty damn sure of it. Not yeah, Twilight, like, but New Moon, I think. It yeah. Was, I think it was New Moon. Yeah, I think so. It was the one yeah. where Jacob's on the motorcycle, and then they fall <laughs> off, and then he takes his shirt off. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that all of them? I think that's all yes. of them. Yes. <laughs> I'm not complaining though. Um, but and <laughs> I'm I'm also one of those people that claps after movies. Um, there we go. I'm usually the only one in the theater <laughs> clapping, but I, I don't care. I'm like it's movies are a form of art, and mm-hmm. e- even if a movie is bad, it's like I haven't made a movie. So I, I'm proud of movie makers for making movies because for it sure. is a hard and long process. And like, mm-hmm. I'm not so much a- applauding the companies that they come out of, but the people who put the work into it. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's what matters to me. Um, yes. But you know, that's just me. So. Well, all of that said, this is a one and a half out of five. <laughs> It was like all of a lead up just for me to like just take a big crap on the movie. This doesn't apply to you. This doesn't. By the way, <laughs> all of that aside, this was not a good movie. But I applaud yeah. them in making it, and I'm glad that Blumhouse is making stuff. And I will say that the highlight of this movie was that I get to watch. I got to watch the Strangers Chapter One trailer again in theaters because I'm looking forward to that one. I like the Strangers movies. Yeah. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> so <laughs> next up is Anthony Hopkins delivering another hell of a performance in One Life. Sir Nicholas Nicky Winton, a young London broker who in the months le- leading up to the World War, just not the World War II, World War II rescued over 600 children from Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, starring Anthony Hopkins and Lena Olin. And just a solid based on a true story movie. And I didn't realize that things about this movie are already like, I'm not going to say viral, but like a really like shared 
video or meme thing around the internet and it's based around this story uh, around uh around swinton's story of saving um over 600 Czechoslovakian uh, Jew children uh, by putting them into foster care in uh, in the UK. Um, and what went viral, we'll say, is the clip of him appearing on a like a like kind of like a variety like news show in the UK, I believe in the 80s, the, maybe the 70s or the 80s. Um, and, uh, um, basically being brought face to face with some of the children that he has saved that he hadn't seen in the decade since. Right. And I, I didn't know these things. So when this happens in the movie, I break open like a pinata of tears. Like it is like so well done and like anthony hopkins never phones in a performance like even if he's in a freaking transformers movie he's still really good like he's gonna be the best person in that transformers movie or that weird exorcism movie that he did years ago the right like he's still gonna be good right and i i mean based on him and this true story i think this movie is very well done and and super accessible and got a good cast around him uh, the younger version of him is played by johnny flynn who um I, I like quite a bit i'm still holding a grudge against him for the movie stardust which was like the unauthorized bio pick of david bowie where he played bowie in it and it just was a bad bad movie and left a really bad taste in my mouth um, but he's really good in this one. Uh, Rom uh, Romola Garai is in this, and I really like her because she's also in Atonement, a movie with Keira Knightley and uh, James McAvoy that I really enjoyed, uh, Joe Wright movie. Um, and yeah, there's there's some emotional scenes with uh, Anthony Hopkins that are going to stick with me because I don't know, just the way he delivers it, you just want to cry with him. <laughs> like it, it's 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 very manipulative. <laughs> But solid movie, uh, great performances, and definitely worth checking out. Uh, so let's head into uh, another film, a foreign film. Uh, well, uh, kind of hybrid foreign film between uh, Iranian and uh, Australian. But it was Australia's official submission to the Academy Awards this year. Didn't make the nominee list, but a damn good movie still called Shada. A young Iranian mother and her six-year-old daughter find refuge in an Australian woman's shelter during the two weeks of the Iranian New Year, now Ruse. Written and directed by Noura Niasari. This is a solid, solid, solid film uh, from the ground up. And basically, it's a, it's a very raw story about one woman's escape from abuse, but everything that it also costs her along the way. And... Um, I mean, there's a lot to this film. There's a lot to unpack in this one. Uh, I mean, she, the the movie kind of plunks you into her story. She's already in a in a in a women's shelter. She's already fleed uh, the father of her child, and uh, um, but it, it like it's also like this. It also has a tinge of like anti religion to it as well. Because that seems to be another thing that's trapping Shada in this one. Because she doesn't have, she doesn't wear the sari. She doesn't cover her head. She cuts her hair at one point in mm -hmm. the film. Like, like she's very obtuse against it. Because I think it's also reflected as the oppressor as well. Because it's also a big driving force to um, her husband abusing her as well. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of depth to this film. Yeah, for sure. And um, I also read that uh, the writer and director, um, she's the six-year-old in this story. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which is interesting as a conduit to look at the story through. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, tacked on to the end of of this film, um is a interview with the real Shada, so Nura's mother. Mm -hmm. And that like that that was a shock because I didn't go into this thinking that it was a real story. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it was yeah. really cool to learn. Yeah. And and it's interesting that you that you bring that up because um the, the Mona's the characters the the, the little girl's name I think Mina I uh, think Mina sorry yeah um she's a lot of her story is she's being dragged along like against her will a, a bunch of times in this film and is really like symbolic the father does it at one point um the uh, Shada does it a couple points in the film. And then the very ending scene in the in the jail, she's basically being dragged to go see her father in another room. And Shada like leaves her to have her own experience. Maybe she le- she maybe she's leaving her to have, you know, her own experience as a father and daughter. Or maybe she can't she doesn't have the strength to face him again like she's done with that path like there's there's so much to unpack and um i i i really have to give it to uh to the lead performance in this film um i totally didn't write down the name because i knew i was gonna botch it (laughs) but uh she's she's really really solid in this movie um and the aspect ratio it's a 133 one uh, ratio which is like very square on the screen and I think it serves the plot of the movie a lot and like you said the time period of the movie yeah because it's a 90s set movie yeah and uh, so, this this movie actually led me to do a little bit of research on like the history of women's shelters in Australia and the first one was in the 1970s um, and it was not supported by the Australian government. And it was run by um, a group of lesbians. And they used cricket bats to defend the shelter. <laughs> so I thought that <laughs> was pretty ass. cool. Someone needs to make that movie. Yeah, definitely. An ungovernment sanctioned women's shelter. With these badass le- lesbians defending it with cricket <laughs> bats, someone needs to make that movie. Yeah. Film Australia or America uh, Australia Film Institute. They, I, there's, I'm trying to remember all the the crawl. There's also the Victoria Film. I watch so much, so many Australian films, so I always remember the the little beginning uh, little studio tags and everything. But <laughs> this is an episode of tangents here yeah. uh, <laughs> sh- uh but that one was actually really relevant and someone should make that damn movie because yes. that's a really great idea um but shade is a damn f- solid movie and um this also is the for this show the 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 immediate distinction of being chloe's first screener yes <laughs> Yeah, I thought I would just bring that up. This is your first screener, your first press screener. Yeah, it was so right on. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Next up, uh, a Blu-ray that was sent to me by WellGo USA, One Percent Warrior. Two ruthless Yakuza gangs interrupt the shooting of an action flick at an abandoned factory. The action star isn't too pleased. One hundred Yakuza against one, too easy. Starring Tak Sakaguchi. Yeah, you got it. Yep, that's his name. Uh, he was he was in a cool movie called uh, Versus in like uh, 2000 era, like a really cool Japanese movie that I highly recommend. It's like very cool. Um, and then he was in a movie with Nicolas Cage, uh, 2018 called Prisoners of the Ghost Land, which is like this post apocalyptic meets samurai movie with a lot of gore and stuff to it, and it, Nicolas Cage freaking rules because he's Nicolas Cage. Of course. Um, it's a badass movie. Um, but he was in that. And I guess they changed the Canadian title because anywhere you look this one up, it's called The One Percenter. Um, but, but yeah, basically, it's about the Yakuza descending on this action, this low budget action movie shoot. And I really wish that they used the idea a bit better and had a bit more fun with it there was a movie that came out a couple years ago or a few years ago now that i saw at the vancouver international film festival called one cut of the dead and it's basically about them filming a zombie movie um and then a real zombie outbreak happens and just the way that it it blended in 
to the behind the scenes chaos I thought was really great. And the one percenter doesn't pull on that thread. And I thought it was kind of a missed opportunity. Um, but I mean, it's mostly cheesy, corny, uh, some really great fight scenes. Like all the fight scenes are really good, but uh, I feel like you're waiting for them to happen. You're just like plotting through the exposition and the plot and you're just like, okay, okay. I just want to see more fights. Let's <laughs> get to this. And I don't know. The whole execution was kind of clunky to me. So um, I would say a skip uh, the one percent warrior, which sounds like a guy with a with a dangerously low cell phone battery. <laughs> Let's move to television uh, with the new Netflix series. This comes from the Game of Thrones, guys. This is three body problem. A fateful decision made in 1960s China reverberates in the present, where a group of scientists partner with a detective to confront an existential planetary threat. Created by David Benioff. 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 That's what I was going to go with. Benioff? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and DB Weiss, based on a book series by what? Are, S- Sixin. Sh- Shin. Sh- I think it's Shin. Shin. I'm going to write this Shin? on on the on the screen. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> And it's available on Netflix. Yep. Yes. So were you were you ever in Game of Thrones? Uh, person? I was, but I never finished it. You never finished it, but you heard the general reaction to the final season, right? Yes. Like basically, people thought it was rushed and um, just not up to what what it was all leading to mm-hmm. and i i definitely agree with it there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of disappointment on my end some of that some of it worked for me some of it didn't work uh but the belief was that benioff and weiss had gotten a star wars gig and that they were rushing to get out of that and in, in, into the star wars gig uh which never materialized um so this is the the next series from those guys so the scrutiny is definitely on yeah. like the internet does not forget and the internet is not forgiving and the internet is really freaking me <laughs> yeah so i came into the show with an open mind um i love a good sci-fi mystery like something with a with with um a good tone to it but this f- show i i being a few episodes in it's just not igniting quick enough it feels like too much of a slow burn too much of a slow burn to the point where some of it is a little dull um and which is disappointing because it's got people from game of thrones i like like it's got um tarly um john bradley um sam tarly he was uh yeah like um, Jon Snow's best yeah. best friend at the watch. Um, he's in it. Uh, Jonathan Price is in it. I mean, who has been in freaking everything um, as well as Game of Thrones. And Benedict Wong is in this. And I really, really, really like Benedict Wong a lot. Um, and, and, you know, he plays to his strengths as well. But it's just like, get going. You know what I mean? Can we can we get rolling like? There wasn't even after at the end of the first episode, there's not even a big enough one to be like, oh, this is awesome. I am engaged. And for a Netflix series where you binge everything, you need to hook people like right away. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I think I, I, I think the viewership might drop off in the first two. And you you don't find you won't find the mainstream mainstream audience sticking around for the long con. So I don't know. I'm waiting for it to drop at this point. So uh, everything just feels a little disjointed and unconnected. And I'm waiting for it all to come together at some point. So, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, guys. (laughs) (laughs) So let's move on now to Apple TV Plus with Palm Royale. An ambitious woman schemes to secure her seat at America's most exclusive table, Palm Beach High Society, circa 1969. A lot of 60s going on. Yeah. Yeah, right? It's the, it's the eras stuff. At least we're not... I don't think we're... Oh, no, we are hitting space in this episode. I was like, we don't have any space coming up. No, we have space coming up. Sorry. We just had it's space. Just, it's the way it goes. Did we just have... Sp- the planetary threat? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But they never actually go to space. Uh, <laughs> yet. 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 That yet. I know of. Yet. Yet. Oh, wow. yet. It's all been it's all been it's all been ground level at this point. Uh yeah, so uh Palm Royale, I uh, just took in the first few episodes of this. Kristen Wiig is in this series. Uh Allison Janney, Josh Lucas, like it's it's a solid ensemble show. Uh Ricky Martin is in this series and I feel like I haven't seen Ricky Martin in like forever. So I'm like why does he look the same as he did in the early 2000s? <laughs> like it's either really it's like either like crazy special effects or that guy is just he doesn't age. He's like he's got that that Paul Rudd serum or something. Uh which I will say Paul Rudd's starting to age. I, I have I have no I have noticed a bit of the aging in Paul Rudd. See, it's slipping. Um, but he's human. Um, but I mean, this show is like floor, like, like Florida in the, uh, in the, um, late sixties. So it's like pastel puke everywhere. Like it is so, it is, it is so pastel colored. Um, but I don't know, uh, woman that kind of cons her way into the high society has a little bit of a, that, um, been there done that edge to it um that uh, they managed to make their own a little bit uh and i think it's all on Kristen wiggs shoulders um so she is the make or break but i generally really like her so i think that it could be an interesting series i don't know if it's a limited series or planned for more than this but it comes from the guy that wrote uh, the eyes of tammy baker or uh, Tammy Faye, sorry, uh, which was a movie that I didn't really enjoy, but it won Jessica Chastain an Oscar, so it can't all be bad. Um, and uh, oh, it's also got Carol Brunette in it. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know who Carol Burnett is. She was like, she had a, sh- a variety show in the seventies um, that was like one of those celebrated cornerstones of comedy. Um, and it, they ran it in reruns on like PBS and stuff. And I absolutely loved it when I was a kid, but she is like, she's kind of in that category of like Dick Van Dyke and, and all of these like now like very old comedy icons. Mm-hmm. Um, and Carol Burnett's a very important one. And she, as far as I'm watching it, she's plays an un- unconscious person <laughs> in this series. So um, doing good work, Carol. Uh, playing unconscious but uh, i'm enjoying it so far uh it's not like wow everyone has to see this so if it does get to that point i will bring it to the show uh let's get on to some sci-fi let's go to space chloe again? we're gonna go space if we're, yeah again <laughs> again and we, we always must return we are, we're always returning to space or the holocaust i don't know <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but this is on Prime Video, I believe. I think I wrote it in the yes. show notes. It's Beacon 23. A man living in the 23rd century works at a remote lighthouse in space that serves as a beacon to help passing ships. Starring Lita Headey and Stephen James. Stephen James. Created by Zach. Stephen James. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Created by Zach Penn, based on the book by Hugh Howey. Who's Lena Headey again? Yeah, Who's familiar. I can't remember who she is. Uh, she's she's Cersei in uh, Game of right. Thrones. Uh, she was also in Three Hundred. Yep. She's badass. She's the villain in Dread. You've seen Dread, right? I think so. With Carl Urban, that movie rules. Maybe not. She's she's badass, and she brings that badass edge to this show. Um, that she's basically running this lighthouse type thing, and and um, Stephen James character, like the the mystery that the first episode sets you up with is they're a mystery to each other. Like basically, she's running she's running this ship. He it, he is. From he is basically taken on board from another ship as a prisoner, and that's how you start the series. There's three seasons of it now. I'm just starting it because I had only really just heard about it, and I love like a good sci fi series. Like, I loved Battlestar Galactica, uh, The Expanse, I really loved Foundations, really great. Like, if it's a really good, ingrained sci fi series, 
I'm in. And Beacon 23 feels like like low cast. Uh, it has that darkness to like a foundation or or the expanse. Um, but it also in scope has a like a little Doctor Who quirkiness to it. I don't know how to explain this, but it has like a Doctor Who filter to it where it feels like that BB that that 2009 BBC era kind of stuff to it. And um Lena's great and Stephen James, he's a Canadian actor. Um I really only know him from the Barry Jenkins film If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a really really good film and he's really really good in it, but it's good to see more of him in this series. So I am excited to continue with this series and I'm pumped that there's three three seasons. I really hadn't heard about this show before a couple of weeks ago when I was looking at what was coming out on Prime and I was like how is there three seasons? But the the fact is it's on like a niche extra thing within the Prime channels. Like it's on something called MGM Plus. And I don't know a lot about this streaming service, but there are like I I wouldn't want to say like 10 to 15 original series being put out by MGM plus this being one of them. There is a Forrest Whitaker one called the Godfather of Harlem that I think was an MGM plus there's like a bunch of them. So I don't know, all these streaming services keep popping up out of nowhere and putting something uh, stuff out that it, they're bound to gain viewership just by having like a niche hit like this one. Yeah. And this like these smaller companies popping up and just pumping stuff out could also be because like mainstream like movies and stuff are you know kind of taking a back seat to indie films and shows and all that so they might be just you know grasping onto the underbelly of that Mm -hmm. well and it's a good place to have other for other shows streaming because it means that there's a little bit of a safety net to your favorite show getting canceled. Yeah. Um, That there is more of a chance that something will get picked up. Unfortunately, our flag means death is not one of the shows that'll get picked up because it got canceled after season two and they shopped it around and, and now it's dead. I, it's now dead. So I really wish that Netflix didn't cancel um the missed show. Mm hmm or that uh, paramount was around still to retake the whole, the reins from it because i believe it was a spike original when it was when it first came out and then netflix netflix also had a production right to it i think i'm pretty sure that's right uh one more uh one more series uh before we had to, a couple of blu-ray things to talk about and it's Turning Point, The Bomb, and The Cold War. The series chronicles the creation of the atomic bomb and the spread of nuclear arms over the following decades. It continues past the dissolution of the Soviet Union to Vladimir Putin's ascent and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Available on Netflix. Yeah, I mean, pulling relevancy everywhere. Because, I mean, the first episode is directly about Robert Oppenheimer and the uh, the nuclear bomb and the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, to, like, some, like, really kind of, like, pretty graphic detail as far as the fallout and, and the video that was that was taken in in those cities and the surrounding areas. Um but I mean, a solid Netflix document, historical documentary from a guy um, named Brian Knappenberger, who also did uh, the program Cons, Cults and Kidnappings, uh, Kidnapping, which is a really interesting doc. And uh, Scouts Honor the Secret Files of the Boy Scouts of America, which is another really, really interesting documentary. Um, and I think this, I mean, this Oppenheimer focus stuff, especially coming off Oppenheimer, just winning the Academy Award and, and winning big at those, at those awards. Um, and then of course we're in year three of the war between Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, it's like everything about this is is really relevant and then to have the discussion of the cold war in between it is 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 very cool too not cool but just like 
it fascinating to watch. Um, but if you like a good uh, historical documentary, um, these series are kind of up your alley. And the Turning Point ones are pretty good um, because there was another one that was, uh, I think it was 9-11 uh, Turning Point that was interesting as well. So, uh, I mean, you can't really rate them, but uh, I thought it was an interesting watch for sure. All right, so let's head into a couple quick Blu-ray things because, I, I mean, I don't really have a lot to, to bring about it. Um, but Suits Complete Series is out, and this gives me the chance to finally finish Suits or to, to start cruising through the seasons. Um, and, you know, reimmersing myself in it with this box set, I love the writing and I love the characters that, um, it transcends it being like a stuffy lawyer show. It becomes more of an interesting character mosaic. And Gabriel Mott is great. Um, and Patrick J. Adams is fantastic. So they're great anchors to the show. Um, my wife, Jen, says that they look alike. So it's a hard show to watch for, for, for her. because She's like, they look so similar that it's like, who am I watching? Um but she was only watching out of the corner of her eye. So um, I will say that the the um, menus are they, they don't have any text. So it's like, OK, what's what? Like, does that play all? Where, where do I access just an episode? Or like, can I get some text and some navigation <laughs> here, please? Like, are we just trying to be cool and trendy by not identifying things? Um, but it's got all nine seasons. It's got an alternate version of the pilot and an alternate version of the season two finale. Gag reels in each season, and I love a good gag reel. Um, but sadly, not enough commentaries. Because comment for a Blu-ray guy like me, commentaries are it's, it's a big deal. That's so. why why you get it. Yeah, Partly. yeah, it's a big reason for it. I don't know if you ever got into suits at all. Did you get in suits? No. No. Not your type, but not your show. I tried to get into <laughs> like, Mad Men, no. and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Mad Men's really good. Yeah, but that's what I people keep saying. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Uh, the other one I got is they sent me the Hangover Trilogy on Blu-ray, all in one case. And I know it's diminishing returns when you go from Hangover to Hangover 2 to Hangover 3, but you kind of need all of them together. It's just, it's the way it goes. This is the complete story. Uh, it also has a documentary on it called uh, Wolfpack Only the Hangover Retrospective. Um, and I, I, I love that crew of people. So uh, I'm definitely, I haven't got to it because I wanted to rewatch the movies, but I'm looking forward to watching the documentary because I'm looking forward to seeing these guys behind the scenes and see the camaraderie there and everything. But I don't know. Did you watch the Hangover movies? Um, I saw the first one and the second one. Okay. See, I haven't seen the third. No. How it all pans out. <laughs> I don't know if you really need to. I don't know. It's a like, detrimental story. You need to see You could it. almost... Yeah, you could almost... Some movies you can almost stand alone the first movie and be like, okay, that's good. That was good. I think I'm good. Yeah. And that maybe should have been it. But it became such a massive hit that it was like, well... We gotta just keep going. Well, the same thing happened <laughs> with Hot Tub Time Machine. Yeah, and the second one, yeah, yeah. Not memorable. I don't remember no. what happens in those movies. We should have got a second. We should have got a second Hot Rod. Yep. I don't know what Rod Kimball would have been doing in it, but we should have. If we're gonna get a second Hot Tub Time Machine, you would think. <laughs> anyway, this tangent out. Uh, brings me to uh, our coming soon for next week, which is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. You're going to get to see it the day before me. Oh, um, because you're going to be in Vancouver seeing it on the Wednesday night. I don't get to see it till a Thursday. So you could you could potentially be the villain and spoiler me. <laughs> potentially. You have the potential to do this. I won't do that. I know you won't. I know you won't. I know you won't. You don't have it in you to do that. And neither, I would not do that to you either. It's the common courtesy of it all. <laughs> but that brings us to the end of this week's episode of What the Hell Should I Watch? I am on Twitter. 
Letterbox, Threads, Instagram at the Steeble Dead. Uh, you can find this show on stevestebbing.ca and uh, the YouTube channel Steve Stebbing, as well as shiftheads.ca. Chloe, you're on Letterboxd. Yeah, you can find me on Letterboxd at Honeybun Chloe or just Chloe Stebbing. And if you want to ask any questions to Chloe or I on this video, you can comment down below. And uh, until next time, we're, we're going to get all Ghostbustery. Ghostbustery. I don't know. How do we end this with one? But uh, see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>